Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for part two of our series on satellite observations and tools for fire risk detection and analysis. Today, we'll be discussing satellites and sensors um, and some associated products for vegetation based fire applications. So hopefully you remember this from session one, um, but here's a quick breakdown of how the full fire series is organized. Uh, the topics of fire touch on various earth systems at pre, during, and post fire stages of the fire cycle. Um, but today we're gonna be really focusing on the pre-fire stage for part two, um, and more particularly, vegetation. So during today's session, uh, we'll be discussing the role of pre-fire vegetation monitoring and mapping in the management and risk assessment of fires. Uh, my name is Zach Bankson, and I'm joined by my colleagues Juan torres Brez and Amber McCullum for this training. So as I mentioned previously, uh, the entire FIRES training um, that we're putting on has six sessions. Um, each one will last for two hours. Uh, the first session in the series was earlier this week. Hopefully you were able to attend. Um, and the remaining sessions will take place on May 18th, 20th, 25th, and 27th. Um, and the same material will be presented twice per day, uh, once in English and once in Spanish. Um, and note that you should only be attending one of those sessions per day. Um, and you can find all of the course materials on the website listed here after the presentations take place. Um, and the instructors vary from session to session, um, but for today's session, um, vegetation-based fire applications, um, you can ask any questions that you might have um, to me or Juan, um, and I put our emails right there. Um, so we will have a Q&A section um, at the end of the session, but if you have any additional questions that we're not able to cover, please feel free to email us at those addresses. So before we dive into the session overview and content, I wanted to first make it really clear why um, we're talking about vegetation mapping in a fires training. So in this session, we're gonna be discussing vegetation from a fire science perspective of fuels characterization and assessment. Fire fuels are widely characterized as anything that can burn, um, but when we discuss fuels from a wildland or agricultural fire perspective, we're typically talking about vegetation. Um, so this includes things like grasses, shrubs, trees, dead leaves, uh, fallen pines and crops. So assessing vegetation characteristics can provide us with useful information about the availability and condition of fire fuels, um, which is something that's really important as a component of pre-fire risk assessment. So remotely sensed data products from various satellites and sensors, uh, some of which we're gonna cover later, give us this really interesting opportunity to analyze vegetation metrics like health, type, extent, moisture, and density, um, all of which influence fire ignition and behavior. Uh, measuring land cover and vegetation indices using satellite and airborne data is also a means to identify and evaluate fire fuels at a landscape scale, which is something that's really uh, great for uh, fire risk assessment and fuels monitoring and mapping um, because it gives you that landscape scale for your uh, vegetation management and fuels management from a fire risk perspective. So given the varied tools we have available to assess vegetation-based factors of fire risk, uh, we'll be covering a wide range of topics today. First, we'll discuss fire risk mapping and how vegetation assessment fits into the framework of fire risk assessment, which we've already done a little bit of so far. Um, and next, we'll discuss a series of vegetation metrics and physical conditions we can assess using remote sensing uh, to really characterize those vegetation fuels and things like ignition likelihood. So then we'll go over some relevant satellites and sensors that can assist in this evaluation of parameters um, and a variety of online tools that can be used to visualize and map fuels at the pre-fire stage. And we will finish the session uh, with a case study assessment of vegetation moisture metrics uh, relevant to the series of fires that occurred in California over the 2020 fire season. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right into uh, fire risk mapping. We're gonna start off by speaking a little more specifically about what we mean by fire risk mapping. Um, and this is particularly relevant at this stage in the training since pre-fire conditions are often used uh, to assess the probability of future fires to inform management and fire warnings employed in mitigation efforts. So to start off with, we're gonna cover some uh, fire risk terminology that will be useful during this session and future sessions of uh, the, the full series of six sessions. Uh, we spoke briefly about the term fuels, but fuels are physical characteristics of live and dead biomass that contribute to spread, intensity, and severity of fires. 
And fuel is typically described in terms of loading, that's weight per unit area, size, uh, things like particle diameter, and bulk density, uh, which is uh, weight per unit volume. And fuel types are categorized using um, an identifiable association of fuel elements of distinctive species, form, size, arrangement, and continuity that will exhibit characteristic fire behavior under different burn conditions. So basically, um, when we're talking about fuel, we're referencing um, things like vegetation type, vegetation extent, those things that provide us with information about the vegetation that fires can use as fuels. And it's important to note that when we're discussing fire risk, what we're typically referring to is the probability that a fire might start in a certain area. And risk is determined by combining uh, relevant factors that influence fire ignition and behavior. Um, like in our case, vegetation type and characteristics from a fuels perspective. So we won't be talking too much about fire regimes within this session, uh, but I think it's important to note how regimes relate um, to the overall fire life cycle. Uh, regimes describe temporal variability in the physical characteristics and subsequent effects of wildland fires. Fire regimes are usually de uh, defined in terms of fire frequency, severity, size, and pattern. And a fire regime is a general description of the role of fire uh, for a specific area or ecosystem um, that it refers to and the nature of uh, fires that occur over an extended period of time within that region. And when we reference fire models, um, we're talking about models that are used to assess fire risk and regimes using mathematical relationships uh, that describe the potential characteristics of a fire. Um, and one input to those models um, are fuel models, and these provide a set of parameters uh, required by the associated fire model to incorporate the influences of fuels into risk assessment. So at this point, you're probably wondering what characteristics are measured in fuel assessments and models. Uh, here we have a general framework for fire risk mapping. The first aspect uh, to predicting fire is the probability of ignition. Ignition sources can vary from lightning to human caused, um, and that's not something we're really gonna be talking about in this session. Uh, but the second aspect, um, and the one that we'll be discussing, discussing most, most within this session, um, is uh, the biophysical influences on fire. The influences with uh, green stars, as you can see on the diagram, are where remotely sensed data can be used independently or with ground-based observation. I and mean, these influences include fuel load, uh, recent climate history, moisture content, vegetation type, um, which is typically used as a metric for flammability, um, as well as overall vegetation and topography. So we'll be covering topics relevant to these categories within this session. Um, and these fa factors can also provide information um, for the third aspect of predicting fire, um, which is the spread of fire once it gets established, um, since different fuel types and conditions uh, influence spread. And it's really important to note uh, that comprehensive fire risk maps uh, can be really, really challenging to produce given all the factors that impact the probability of fire. Um, but we're really gonna try to do our best within this session to cover some methods and products that can assist in your own fire risk estimations, at least from a vegetation perspective. All right. So as I mentioned previously, we're gonna be focusing this training on uh, those remotely sensed observations that can really assist us with uh, the estimation of vegetation-based biophysical influences on fires. Um, and we'll explore some topics related to fuel load, moisture, vegetation type and stage, uh, as well as topography. Basically the things we just went over in that uh, fire risk modeling framework. So the parameters that we cover within the following sections can be used as inputs for fire models, and general risk assessments to incorporate the influence of fuels and topography on fire likelihood and behavior. So we'll go ahead and jump right into discussing these vegetation-based parameters um, and how to use remote sensing to evaluate them over a landscape scale. So there are a lot of variables used to assess fire potential. Um, and unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to go over an inclusive list of these parameters and techniques from a vegetation-based perspective. Um, but we'll be going over the basic categories of vegetation analysis useful for fuels and fire risk assessment. And we'll be providing some suggested remote sensing methods for evaluating um, these parameters within each category. 
So this slide has a quick overview of the topics we're going to be covering. And the major categories we'll be going over are vegetation type and extent, stage and health, moisture content, structure, and topography. So first of all, we're going to talk about some ways in which we can use remote sensing to map vegetation type and extent. A familiar way in which to do this is via land cover classification. As you might already know, land cover classification is the process of grouping similar pixels in remote sensing imagery based on a land cover classification uh, of classes such as forest, shrubland, and agriculture. And how specific each class is depends on your analysis of imagery and access to ground truth data. And as you can see on the right, this land cover map of Sub-Saharan Africa provides uh, more specific classes, um, allowing for a more fine scale characterization of fuel type and extent. And the scale of classification, whether general class, vegetation type, or even plant species, is typically, is typically left up to uh, the fire analyst and what level of classification works best for management or decision-making purposes. And mapping different vegetation types um, is important for fire risk since fuel behavior varies depending on the type of vegetation present. Um, and for example, forests contain more biomass to sustain burning, um, but shrubland landscape vegetation might ignite more easily. So differentiating fuel types and mapping their extent is a great way to start understanding vegetation-based fire risk within a study area. Um, and I've linked uh, two our set trainings that we've done previously here um, for more detail on completing your own land cover classification. Um, and one of these trainings uh, covers land classification um, using optical imagery and the other uses uh, SAR data. And next, uh, fractional cover refers to estimating the proportion of an area that is covered by each member of a predefined, predefined set of vegetation or land cover types. And in terms of remote sensing, uh, the area being considered is generally a pixel, although fractional cover estimates can be applied um, in cases like this. Uh, but the estimation of fractional cover is often considered a type of spectral unmixing, um, which can get a little bit more complicated. So what this basically means is that ground data collected over the extent of a pixel can be used to refine the classification at the subpixel level. Um, but what we're really gonna focus on um, uh, for this session is how this is relevant to fire applications and how fractional cover kind of comes to play with land cover classifications. So fractional cover can provide insights into areas of dry vegetation and bare soil, um, as well as allow the mapping of living vegetation extent um, by grouping live vegetation indicators like leaves, grass, growing crops, um, dead or dry vegetation indicators like branches, uh, dead branches, dry grasses, or leaf litter, and unvegetated land cover types like bare soil and rock, you can examine fuel, ability, fuel availability and type over an entire landscape, uh, country, or management area. And the information gained by fractional cover assessment can allow for a more accurate assessment of land cover and the differentiation between living and dead vegetation over landscape at the subpixel level um, can also be really meaningful for fire mit mitigation. For example, uh, by monitoring the proportion of dead or dying vegetation, uh, managers can identify areas where dry vegetation removal might be necessary to decrease available fire fuels. Moving on to the next element of vegetation-based landscape monitoring we'll discuss um, is vegetation stage and health. Unhealthy vegetation uh, typically has a higher percentage of drier biomass, uh, like dead or dying leaves and branches, uh, making unhealthy vegetation easier to burn. So the stage of vegetation also dictates the amount and types of fuels available for fires. And an important component of vegetation, uh, vegetation stage is phenology. Phenology is a science of seasonal variation in plant development. Um, that's things like blooms, buds, um, and crop growth. I um, mean, the figure on the top left, uh, sorry, top right, describes the seasonal change um, uh, from an NDVI perspective. And measuring seasonal variation in vegetation uh, using a land surface phenology assessment from remote sensing data um, can really demonstrate changes in fuel loads over time. But we're not really going to be going more in depth about phenology during this session. Um, we just recently did a, a phenology training through our set. Um, so I've linked that here so you can take a closer look if you're interested um, in 
more training about uh, assessing phenology. So for the rest of this section, um, we're gonna be covering some relevant vegetation indices for monitoring vegetation stage and health. So a lot of you are probably already familiar with the most commonly used vegetation index, and that's the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. And as a quick overview of how this is calculated, uh, when sunlight strikes a plant, uh, strikes plant leaves, uh, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorbs visible light, uh, blue and red, and the cell structure of the leaves reflects green and strongly reflects near-infrared light. So the two key wavelengths for NDVI are the red and near-infrared, and using mathematical formulas, uh, like the one shown on the slide for NDVI, scientists can transform that raw satellite data um, about light waves into vegetation indices. And a vegetation index is an indicator that describes the greenness, uh, basically the relative uh, density and health of the vegetation um, for each picture element or pixel um, in a satellite image. So greener vegetation is typically considered healthier um, seasonal greenup patterns can identify changes in fuel loads, um, and the detection of vegetation anomalies uh, can also identify drastic changes in vegetation conditions um, that may make an area more at risk for fire. It's also important to note that ND NDVI is not the only vegetation index available for analysis, and you might find that some other vegetation indices are more useful for your particular study area. So here are a couple of additional vegetation indices that you might find useful. Um, we have the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, um, which is another measure, measure of vegetation health in stage via greenness. It's particularly useful in regions where, dense veg, where there's dense vegetation, um, because oftentimes NDVI can oversaturate or hit a maximum value in these regions. Um, EVI has a higher threshold and can identify more subtle differences in dense forest regions like the Amazon. Um, the next index we have is the Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, or SAVI, um, which minimizes the influence of bare or nearly bare ground when trying to assess vegetation. And SAVI is useful in semi-arid and arid regions, um, like the southwestern United States, uh, where there is a greater bare ground or uh, soil cover in relationship to vegetation. So here the near-infrared and uh, red bands are still used, uh, but a correction factor is applied for that SAVI. And so anomalies in vegetation indices are often used to show uh, current vegetation patterns uh, relative to long-term averages. And you can use any vegetation index that works best for your region, as long as you have enough data to establish a long-term mean. So this can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean um, from the current value and is often done on a monthly basis. Um, for example, if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that the vegetation is less green than normal, which may be indicative of drought-like conditions or abnormally high temperatures impacting vegetation health. And so we have an example here on the slide. Um, this is a Veers NDVI anomaly map um, on the right of the slide. Uh, to show some negative anomalies that we can see throughout Northern California on July 3rd in 2020. Um, and that's prior to the August 2020 fires mentioned in the previous session, um, in session one. And so the instructors during that session discussed how warm and dry conditions contributed to fire risk in this area. And the NDVI anomaly map here on the slide um, kind of supports this point as vegetation was likely drier due to low moisture and higher temperatures. All right, so noting that NDVI anomalies may result from low moisture conditions is a great segue into our next topic. Um, vegetation moisture is an important factor when considering uh, fuel ignition and burning. Uh, low moisture vegetation acts as drier fuel and is often more likely to ignite and contribute to the spread of fire. Uh, dry vegetation can also influence uh, the moisture of the surrounding environment, providing more favorable conditions for fire. So one method for assessing vegetation moisture is via fuel moisture content, which is the ratio of leaf water content to dry leaf matter. And this can also be quantified indirectly via evapotranspiration, which is uh, just the sum of evaporation from the land surface plus transpiration from plants. And there are also relevant vegetation indices that can provide information about 
uh, moisture content like the normalized difference water index, uh, the normalized dry matter index, and the evaporative stress index, um, which we're going to go over in the next few slides. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about live fuel moisture content and radar remote sensing of vegetation moisture um, during our case study of 2020 California fires uh, at the end of, of this session. So first, uh, the normalized difference water or moisture index, um, or NDWI, uh, uses a shortwave infrared band, uh, which is more sensitive to water within vegetation. Uh, thus, it can detect subtle changes in vegetation moisture, um, which makes it useful as a metric for live fuel moisture assessment um, and also assessment of drought. So this index is frequently used for identifying dry fuels in forests to determine susceptibility to large wildfires. Um, and low live fuel moisture uh, creates a fuel environment susceptible to fire, uh, especially in ecosystems that possess large amounts of live and dead fuels. And fuel moisture content, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the ratio of leaf water content and leaf dry matter content. Uh, one approach for remote sensing of fuel moisture content has been to estimate the change in canopy water content over time using a liquid water spectral index uh, called the normalized dry matter index, um, which was developed for the remote sensing of dry matter content in green leaves, um, specifically using high spectral resolution data. So NDMI is a narrow band normalized index combining two distinct wave bands centered at uh, 1,649 nanometers and 1,722 nanometers. Um, and this index estimates uh, the dry matter content of vegetation. Um, and it provides important information about fuel loads. Um, and when you divide a spectral water index by this NDMI, uh, you can have a really useful way to estimate live fuel moisture content. And it's also really important to note um, that at this stage, calculation of NDMI is limited to available hyperspectral data um, from missions like Avaris uh, due to the spectral requirements of this index. And a newer global data set called Evaporative Stress Index, or ESI, is available online and produced weekly at a, a pretty high resolution for the entire globe. Um, it reveals regions of drought where vegetation is stressed due to lack of water. Um, the ESI can be very helpful in capturing early signals of things like flash drought, um, a, a condition that's brought on by extended periods of hot, dry, and windy conditions uh, leading up to rapid soil moisture depletion. And reduced, weight, reduced rates of water loss can be observed through the use of land surface temperature before it can be observed um, through decreases in vegetation health or greenness like we just discussed. Um, and the ESI describes soil moisture across the landscape. Um, and it's based on satellite observations of land surface temperature, which are used to estimate water loss due to evapotranspiration. And as a quick reminder, evapotranspiration is the loss of water via evaporation from soil and plant surfaces um, and via transpiration through plant leaves. So generally, healthy green vegetation with access to an adequate supply of water um, warms at a much slower rate than dry or stressed vegetation. And a plant's first response uh, when stressed from lack of water is to reduce their transpiration to conserve water within the plant. So based on variations in land surface temperature, uh, the ESI indicates how the current rate of evapotranspiration compares to uh, normal conditions. So negative ESI values show below normal evapotranspiration rates, indicating vegetation that is stressed due to inadequate soil moisture. And ESI can be a really helpful tool in identifying areas um, of dry or stressed vegetation that act as better fuels for fire. And I've just provided a quick, a quick map um, here of the US for August 2020 of ESI, um, but we're gonna be taking a closer look at that as well um, during our California case study. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next aspect of vegetation-based landscape monitoring, um, and that's vegetation structure. Uh, radar and LIDAR data provide information about canopy height, vegetation density, and overall 3D structure of vegetated areas. And these aspects are really important factors to consider when you're thinking about things like fire spread, um, available biomass for burning, and the impacts of vegetation on the surrounding environmental conditions that influence fire. And I also wanted to just go ahead and uh, plug the USGS 3DEP uh, LiDAR Explorer, Explorer tool here, which I've linked um, on the slide. 
Uh, this is a really great tool to start exploring some LiDAR data in the US. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that obtaining LiDAR data can be a little bit challenging uh, since the majority of this data comes from airborne missions operated at the country, uh, at the country or state level. Uh, so I highly recommend checking what LiDAR resources are available through um, any relevant land management organization in your country or state, um, just to get your hands on some of that LiDAR data. So in the case of wildland fire, uh, canopy height and density influence fire dynamics uh, directly as fuel. Uh, measuring density is a really Im uh, important factor um, to consider since dense vegetation can allow fires to spread over a greater extent um, and also more quickly. Uh, canopy height information also provides um, an estimation of ladder fuels or those fuels that can allow fires to spread vertically into the canopy. Um, things like shorter trees, uh, low-hanging branches, or shrubs. And heightened density also influence fire dynamics indirectly through their influence on other variables in the fire environment. Um, for example, a uh, three-dimensional fuel structure has been shown to have an influence on fuel moisture re regimes, um, with the forest floor being consistently more moist under, moist under dense canopies. So estimation of density, height, and overall 3D structure can be really useful as well in terms of biomass assessments. Um, biomass is considered as uh, a means to assess fuel loads. Um, which provides a little bit more information about some of the burn potential that you might have within a study area. And also use of synthetic aperture radar or SAR um, and LIDAR are means to assess these factors over really large areas and landscapes, um, which once again is something super helpful from a management perspective. All right, and to give you a quick idea of how this works, um, here's, here's an example of volume scattering in a uh, forest, uh, and we've, we've kind of plucked this slide directly from our forest mapping with SAR data training, um, which I really highly recommend you check out if you're interested in this. Um, but scattering uh, may come from the leaf canopy at the tops of the trees, uh, the leaves and branches further below, um, and the tree trunks and soil at the ground level. And volume scattering may serve to decrease or increase image brightness, uh, depending on how much of the energy is scattered uh, out of the volume and back to the radar. So this figure illustrates um, all of the possible scattering mechanisms within a forest. I'm not gonna go over them um, in quite the amount of detail as on the figure, um, but basically the radar sent from the sensor returns to the sensor at varying degrees after interacting with vegetation, um, which allows the sensor to kind of piece together this information about the structure of vegetated landscapes. And so when we're speaking specifically about canopy height, um, Forest, uh, forest stand height is a frequently used metric, and it provides an estimate of the average height of trees in a forest stand, and acts as a really useful indicator of forest age and structure, um, especially in the assessment of above ground biomass. So this makes it useful at the pre-fire stage um, from a fuel, a fuel availability perspective. And as we mentioned previously, mapping vegetation height over a forested landscape, um, like has been done in the maps you can see here on the slide, can also provide information about potential ladder fuels and their proximity to high fuel load tree stands. Now, when we talk about canopy density, uh, we're typically referring to structural elements like openings in vegetated areas, single trees separated from tree stands, and clumps of trees with adjacent or interlocking crowns. And simply put, um, this is just closer together uh, denser vegetation provides consistent and more accessible fuel loads uh, to fires, influencing their ability to spread across a landscape. And when mapped, uh, like in the figure you see here on the slide as well, um, created using LIDAR data, uh, dense and sparsely vegetated areas are identifiable over entire landscapes, um, which is also kind of why I've restated that, that capability of SAR and LIDAR to do this large scale assessment on the slide. And landscape scale mapping like this can be really helpful in identifying areas where fire may spread more readily and have uh, greater access to fuels as well. So the last element of landscape mapping that we're going to discuss is topography. Uh, topography can greatly influence the ignition spread and severity of fires. Um, factors that affect fires are uh, slope, 
aspect, elevation, and topographic features. Um, and we'll talk about each of these in the in the next few slides individually. So first, elevation affects fire behavior by influencing the amount and timing of precipitation, um, as well as exposure to prevailing wind. Elevation also affects the seasonal drying of fuel. In lower elevation, uh, fuels tend to dry out earlier in the year because of higher temperatures and lower precipitation. And then the opposite is also true for fuels at higher elevations. There's also a tendency for more lightning strikes and subsequent ignitions to occur at higher elevations. So next we have slope. Um, slope is how steep or inclined the land surface is um, and it impacts the spread of fire. Uh, increased slope often equates to faster fire spread. Fires tend to spread faster up a slope than down a slope. Um, since heat rises in front of the fire, it more effectively preheats and dries upslope fuels, um, which makes for more rapid combustion of vegetation. Now, aspect or the direction of the slope affects how much solar radiation a site receives and also the vegetation type. So south and west facing slopes tend to have less vegetation and lighter fuel loads, uh, particularly in lower elevation forests. And south slopes receive much higher solar radiation and are warmer. So fuels tend to dry out sooner and more thoroughly um, during the fire season in those areas. In contrast, uh, north slopes have more vegetation and hence heavier fuel loads. So north slopes are cooler and more shaded, um, thus delaying the drying of fuels long into the fire season. Um, but because of their higher fuel loading, um, heavily vegetated northern slopes uh, can experience more uh, severe wildfires. So it's also important to note, um, in this case, particularly with aspect, um, we're speaking from the Northern Hemisphere perspective, um, and you can see a little reminder of that here in the figure. Um, some of this is uh, slightly different for the, the Southern Hemisphere. All right, and lastly, uh, landscape features like narrow and wide canyons, ridges, and saddles can dramatically affect fire behavior. Uh, these features can change prevailing wind patterns by funneling air, um, increasing wind speed, um, and thereby intensifying fire behavior. Fires on lateral ridges, um, and that's those coming off a main ridge, can burn in any direction and be affected by wind moving up through canyons and saddles. Um, other features, including rock outcropping, streams, rivers, lakes, and roads, act as fire barriers and uh, can be used as anchor points for developing fuel breaks. And firefighters often take advantage of these natural, um, as well as man-made features in attacking and suppressing wildfires. So that kind of ends our discussion about the parameters that we're interested in assessing for this session. I know that was a lot of information. Um, all of these slides are gonna be available, like I mentioned, so please feel free to go back, um, look back over them. It was a lot of information. Um, but I hope we made it clear why these parameters are important for fire risk. Um, and I, I hope it is clear why each of these uh, variables that we discussed could be useful as an input for fire risk mapping um, or general risk assessment. So now that we have discussed um, what we're interested in measuring and mapping using remote sensing, um, let's go over the satellites and sensors that we can actually use to complete this, uh, this type of vegetation-based fire risk assessment. And just remember that these sensors have uh, a wide variety of applications, some of which you might be familiar with, um, but we're only gonna be discussing those applications that are useful from a vegetation perspective. So we'll start off with a couple of sensors that are likely very familiar to you. Um, the Landsat series and Sentinel-2. Landsat is probably one of the most recognizable satellite platforms, uh, with Landsat 8 in particular um, being launched in 2013, um, and Sentinel-2 was launched in 2015 and provides pretty similar spectral data. However, however, you'll note that there are differences in spatial and temporal resolution um, between the two platforms, and we have those listed here um, on the slide for your quick reference. Um, so both Landsat and Sentinel-2 provide multispectral data, um, this data covers a wide range of vegetation-based fire applications, um, including land cover classification, 
um, a variety of vegetation indices um, and vegetation moisture via the normalized difference water index. So these sensors tend to uh, be the go-to for land cover classification in particular, um, given their spatial resolution. Um, and also, uh, similarly with vegetation products, they're also kind of a go-to for those um, vegetation indices we've, we've talked about, like NDVI, EVI, and SADI. Um, and those uh, data products are either available in a pre-processed format or um, these sensors typically have standard operating procedures that you can use to calculate them. Um, and the Landsat NDWI in particular um, is a really frequently used metric for moisture. So next, MODIS is one of the key imaging instruments for the NASA Earth Observing System. Um, and it's designed to measure these really large scale global dynamics across land, oceans, and atmosphere. Um, and these instruments generate daily continuous global uh, data that's really helpful from that temporal resolution perspective for assessing Earth's parameters. Um, and for fires, uh, MODIS is very useful um, due to its daily recurrence rate. Um, fuel related vegetation metrics like land classification, NDVI, and EVI are all available at this high temporal resolution, which really makes MODIS a, a great resource for consistent monitoring. And this high temporal resolution is also really helpful for the detection of phenological shifts. Um, and you can see a large scale example of this here on the slide. Um, and the figure shows vegetation shifts over time using uh, MODIS and DVI in Africa. And it's important to note, however, that the spatial resolution of MODIS might be a limiting factor um, for use, just depending on the size of your study area. Another newer satellite that's important for wildfire applications um, is VIRS. Uh, VIRS was launched on board um, the Suomi NPP on October 28th of 2011. And there are 22 bands measured by VIRS. Um, this is typically considered uh, to be a continuation um, of the MODIS mission in terms of data availability and the type of data that's made available through VIRS. Um, but when we're talking about fires, we're particularly interested in VIRS um, for its ability um, to calculate vegetation indices uh, like NDVI and EVI. Um, and it also has some pretty robust vegetation health indices available as well. Um, you can see here is a map of uh, Kenya examining uh, the vegetation health index. And this is a pre-processed uh, data product that's just available um, straight through VIRS. And you can use the link uh, there in the image credit if you're interested in vegetation health indices through beers. All right. So the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite, or SMAP, which you heard about in session one, measures soil moisture in the top five centimeters of soil. And we're really not going to cover uh, too much more of the technical information about SMAP since you already heard about it in the previous session. Um, but the soil moisture data from SMAP provides useful information about vegetation moisture, um, and associated evaporative stress. Um, and the drought information that you get from the sensor is also pretty useful in identifying um, areas where vegetation and thus fire fuels might be more dry. All right. And a newer satellite instrument on board the ISS is called the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, um, or EcoStress. And it measures temperature to better understand water stress and vegetation moisture dynamics. With data starting in August 2018, EcoStress provides vegetation stress information at a spatial resolution of 70 meters um, in areas around the globe. And for example, you can see an evaporative stress index assessment here um, completed for Poland on the side. Um, you can see it's a small study area within Poland. And you'll note that within the map, high vegetation stress areas are visible in red over the majority of the study area, um, while low stress is predominantly located in the northwest portion of the study area. And this is just a really quick example of um, what you can kind of do with the outputs of EcoStress. I mean, kind of this utility of ESI mapping as a way to um, estimate vegetation stress and fuel moisture. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to our first hyperspectral sensor. Um, that's EO1 Hyperion. And this is one of the most popular hyperspectral satellite systems. Um, and it was launched in November of 2000 and was decommissioned in 2017. It collected 220 unique spectral channels ranging from 357 to 2,576 nanometers um, with a 10 nanometer bandwidth. 
Um, it also has a spatial resolution of 30 meters for all bands. And the large number of bands um, that kind of come along with this Hyperion data uh, spaced closely together um, gives it more information about the Earth's surface. And that's kind of the, uh, the reason that we do hyperspectral remote sensing is to get that more detailed spectral information. So this makes Hyperion data particularly useful for land cover classification um, that's better at differentiating vegetation types. And with the right coupling of ground data, um, you can even map plant species over the landscape, um, as you can see here in this example of uh, Hyperion vegetation species mapping. And this more accurate uh, type of vegetation mapping uh, really provides better characterization of fuel type and content. And uh, just as a note, if you're looking for Hyperion data, um, there's a variety of Hyperion data scenes that are available um, that have been processed and archived, and you can use platforms like Earth Explorer um, to access this imagery if you're interested. So in addition to Hyperion, uh, the Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer also provides hyperspectral data. Um, as the name indicates, uh, Avris is an airborne sensor and it's been flown on four aircraft platforms in North America, Europe, and portions of South America. Avris also collects data um, in 224 contiguous spectral bands with wavelengths from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. Um, and each band is, once again, um, similar to Hyperion, about 10 nanometers in width. So Avris hyperspectral data is really useful for this, this differentiation of fuel types that we kind of look for from hyperspectral data. Um, and a really good example of this um, can be seen here in uh, the map on the slide. Um, a NASA developed program team out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory used Avris imagery um, as a means to map pre-fire vegetation type and extent in the Santa Monica Mountains in 2018. Um, kind of right before the Woolsey fire. And Avris data allowed them um, to more successfully differentiate vegetation types in areas um, to identify fuel sources that contributed to bur burning during the Woolsey fire itself. So Avris data can also be used to calculate uh, the normalized dry matter index. And as you'll recall from earlier, NDMI provides useful vegetation moisture and fuel content information, um, but it can currently only be calculated using hyperspectral imagery. So the last series of sensors we'll be discussing are LIDAR and radar-based. The Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, or JEDI, is aboard the ISS, and it produces high-resolution laser ranging observations, or LIDAR data, of the 3D structure of Earth. Uh, JEDI's precise measurements of forest canopy, height, uh, canopy vertical structure, and surface elevation allow us to characterize many of the vegetation structure metrics we discussed earlier, um, as well as some topical, topographical information on top of that. So a great example of this is the sample map we have here um, generated by the JEDI team for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which shows tree height over the landscape. And next up, we have uh, the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM. This is our main suggestion for topography mapping. Uh, SRTM uses radar data to determine the main topographic factors that influence fires. Um, and as you'll remember from our discussion of topography, those are slope, aspect, elevation, and topographic features. Uh, the SRTM uh, digital elevation model uh, data includes those parameters and can also be used um, for a fairly comprehensive assessment of topography in your study area um, at either the 30 meter or 90 meter resolution. Another radar-based sensor, Sentinel-1, um, has a wide-ranging series of vegetation applications. Um, Sentinel-1 SAR data is useful for land classification to complete fuel assessment, and radar data is also not constrained by cloud cover in the same way that optical data is, um, which makes this type of data particularly useful for really cloudy regions. And as we discussed earlier, SAR data is also useful for the measurement of vegetation structure, um, like canopy height and density. I'm going I'm to just go ahead and plug that forest mapping with SAR data training um, again here. Definitely take a look at it um, if you're interested in using SAR data to map vegetation. So radar data from this sensor is also useful for uh, the estimate of fuel moisture content um, and vegetation dryness, but we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the case study section um, at the end of the session. 
So another source of radar data. Um, and the last uh, satellite sensor we're going to be speaking about um, is the JAXA Advanced Land Observing Satellites Phased Array L-Band Synthetic Aperture Radar, or ALOS PALSAR. From 2006 to 2011, uh, PALSAR's L-Band SAR data yielded detailed all-weather day and night observations um, and provided repeat passes of in interferometry. Uh, PALSAR was developed to contribute to the fields of precise regional land cover observation and resource surveying, and SAR data from PALSAR can be used to map vegetation structure, um, as seen here in this map of northern Tanzania, uh, showing vegetation cover and density. So this data is also useful for topographic assessments um, and can be used for some of the same topography for parameters as SRTM. So now I know I just went over a lot of satellites and sensors. Um, so I've compiled an overview slide here for your reference later. Um, the data products column also has um, some links in it that are relevant uh, to products that you might find useful. Um, and just keep in mind that this isn't an inclusive list of data products. Um, and there might be other satellite sensors, platforms, or data products um, that are useful for your own vegetation-based fire risk assessment. Um, so kind of view this as a way to get started um, exploring these kinds of data um, in the lens of fires. All right, now let's talk about some of the available tools for visualizing vegetation-based fire parameters. Um, these tools use data from the sensors that we just went over, as well as a variety of modeled and ground-based data sets as well. So it's an interesting opportunity to see how some of this data comes together. <clears throat> So first we'll discuss the land fire data uh, viewer distributed by USGS. Land fire provides detailed land cover maps. Uh, as you can see here, I have the viewer set to vegetation type um, and zoom to California. Uh, the land cover assessment is broken up into vegetation subtypes and includes classes that uh, are state specific. So you'll notice here that there are multiple classes um, for describing the vegetation in California woodland areas. So this is a really interesting way to start getting an idea of what vegetation is present in your study area if you don't already know. Um, and it's a pretty reliable uh, land cover uh, assessment um, kind of across the United States. So land fire also includes uh, fuel models to visualize vegetation in the context of fuel categories um, and provides information about vegetation structure uh, with metrics like canopy density and height. It also includes information about fire regimes uh, noting patterns and return interval intervals in site-specific burn cycles. So the viewer also displays relevant topographic data uh, like elevation, slope, and aspect. Um, and the figure here on the slide shows uh, the slope layer displayed for California. And just remember that slope is a useful metric when evaluating uh, the spread of fire potential. And as I mentioned previously, um, just also note that um, Land fire is only for uh, the United States. So this unfortunately is not a, a global platform, um, but we'll be talking about some more of those a little bit later. So another tool um, useful for the characterization of fuels is the North American Wildland Fuels Database. This tool aggregates fuel loading information from over 26,000 field sites um, compiled from 271 data sources to provide fuel load estimates um, by vegetation type and category. So some of these fuel categories include trees, uh, shrubs, litter, and tree crown. You can set the tool to your chosen fuel type, and the map will display fuel loads in metric ton per hectare. And as you can see here, I've shown an example of that. Um, I set the fuel to shrubs and zoom to California to get a better look at shrub fuels across the state. So our last North American um, kind of US focused tool is the forest inventory analysis. And the FIA consists of reports on status and trends in uh, species size and health of trees, um, as well as total tree growth, mortality, and removals by harvest. And this includes uh, things like remote sensing classifications, um, field samples, and forest health measures. Um, and this data can also be particularly helpful in your own assessments of land cover and vegetation type. Um, for example, ground data from the FIA that identifies tree species um, in a specific area can be used to, to ground truth uh, land cover classifications that you may have already completed. All right, so this tool um, is a little different from those that we've just gone over. 
Um, Firecast is an international tool that acts as an analysis and alert system for delivering near real-time monitoring products um, via emails. So these alerts include um, risk of fire within a user specified area of interest, um, areas like uh, protected areas, specific land cover areas, um, or user defined regions. And alerts also include map images depicting the locations of uh, fires or risk of fires. So the system currently only operates um, in countries within South America, um, Indonesia, and Madagascar. Um, but if that happens to be you, this could be a really useful tool um, for getting notifications about fire risk. So this next tool I wanted to highlight is an example of a Google Earth Engine app that's useful for live fuel moisture content estimation. Um, and this app displays fuel moisture content globally using the methods defined by uh, Rao et al. in 2020. Um, we'll be discussing um, this tool and the product a little bit more in depth during our California case study, um, but the link to uh, the publication is on the app page if you want to take a look at it. And this next tool is also a means to assess fuel moisture. Uh, this map viewer displays a global evaporative stress index product created by NASA and the USDA. Um, and as a reminder, uh, healthy green vegetation with access to an adequate supply of water warms at a much slower rate than does dry or stressed vegetation. Um, so this weekly ESI data is based on variations in land surface temperature. And the ESI is a really good indicator of uh, the current rate of, of evapotranspiration um, and how that compares to normal conditions. I um, mean, it provides information about fuel dryness as well as that evaporative stress. So we'll also be taking a closer look at this one um, during our California case study, but I wanted to go ahead and mention these two um, vegetation moisture tools here while we're discussing tools and then go a little bit more in depth during our case study. So I think you've had a little bit of exposure to this tool in the last session, um, at least in terms of land cover. Um, but the Global Wildfire Information System, or GWIS, is a joint initiative of the GEO Work Program and Copernicus, um, which is the European service that delivers near real-time data um, to users on a global level. And the goal of GWIS is to provide a comprehensive view and evaluation of fire regimes and fire effects at the global level. Um, so GWIS builds on a lot of uh, ongoing activities that we've listed here on the slide. Um, what we're really interested in is the GWIS viewer, um, which can be found on uh, the website listed here as well. And I actually am going to be showing you some of the features of this viewer um, in a demonstration. So in particular, I want to show you two readily accessible features on GWIS that provide general estimates of land cover type, um, as well as metrics for fuel mapping. Um, and we're going to use Sub-Saharan Africa as our focal region. And this region in particular relies on the differentiation of agricultural fires from those fires burning in natural landscapes. Um, so estimation of land cover and fuel type can really assist in this differentiation um, so that management is better suited for uh, the different challenges these fires produce. So that said, let's go ahead and take a look at GWIS. Okay, so here we have the main page of GWIS. Um, you'll notice there's, there's some information about how GWIS is created, um, some potential contacts that you might have, projects associated with with GWIS that you might be interested in. Um, but what we're really interested in here are uh, the GWIS applications. And there's a couple ways to navigate to these um, on this main page. You can either go here in GWIS applications or just right here on the menu bar. Um, but I think the first thing that we wanna take a look at is the current situation viewer. And so this is kind of the general uh, GWIS viewer um, where you can click to show various um, map layers, um, and, and for our purposes, we're really interested in those that cover um, uh, kind of this fuels mapping perspective and land cover classification. So there are a couple of layers that I want to show you. Let's see. So we have the CCI land cover. Um, so this is a, a global land cover data set um, that can provide you with some useful information about land cover in your area. We're focusing on sub-Saharan Africa um, for our purposes of this training. Um, I want to click on the legend right here. Let's see. Oh, wrong one. There we go. There's the legend. <laughs> um, so taking a look at the legend of this land cover classification, um, you can see that uh, while there are some general land classes, um, there are actually 
quite a few specifications built into those, especially for things like tree cover. Um, you have further specification into broad-leaved or needle-leaved. Um, you have a couple of shrubland classes as well. Um, so this is a really good place to start with land cover. Um, if, you're, if you're not really sure where to go for a land cover data set, you need one, or you're not sure you necessarily need to do your own um, for vegetation type and extent mapping. Um, but we can take a quicker zoom in here. So as you'll notice, um, you can zoom in on various areas of land cover classification. It's really gonna end up being whatever is most useful for you. Um, we're gonna show you um, a more country focused approach to this. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna show you one more layer in this general um, data viewer. Let's see, so we're gonna unclick our CCI land cover. And we've got this, this great tab right here that's obviously very relevant for us that maps fuels. We'll go ahead and let that load for a second. Great. And so this just basically does an, a little bit of extra work to group um, some of those land cover classifications um, into relevant fuel types. Um, so this is really helpful if you're, if you're not sure what fuel types exist within your study area or you just want to get an idea about the overall fuel composition um, within a zone of interest. And you can see here, um, the forest classes tend to be compressed in this case, um, but you still have differentiation based off of needle-leaved or broad-leaved. Um, you have some other information there, whether or not the forest ecosystem is, say, uh, temperate or Mediterranean, um, things like that. Um, not necessarily completely relevant for the area that we're looking at right now, um, but you'll notice particularly here for um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we have um, these broad-leaved or mixed forests. Um, that end up being a, a pretty big source of, of fuel for fires. Um, and then we also have um, a couple of different, um, let's see, cropland classifications as well. Um, and you'll notice those in yellow here. Um, it was an interesting way to kind of identify cropland from a fuel type perspective. Um, but as I mentioned before, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this a little bit more on a country-based level. Um, if you're interested in the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa, this is definitely the way to go. Or if you're just interested in exploring data, um, with kind of no specific management area in mind. Um, this can be a really helpful way to start visualizing data. Well, we're gonna go ahead and go back to the GWIS main page. And what we're really interested in and something that GWIS is really interested in us using is this brand new country profile. And so you can also click on that here. So here with the GWIS country profile, um, we're able to select our country of interest. And so for us, we're gonna pick a country within Africa. Some of this is gonna look a little bit familiar because um, we're gonna take a look at Zambia, which you might remember uh, the land cover classification from GWIS um, from session one. Um, but this is uh, the country profile viewer um, from GWIS. It gives you an opportunity to look at um, land cover classification. Um, at various scales. Um, so you see here, we have, as you see here, we have um, the country bounds of Zambia. We can take a quick look at some of the basic land class, um, land classifications within the country and get a pretty quick idea of what some of the major fuel types are, what vegetation cover is looking like. Um, and it also provides these graphs here that talk about um, kind of the percent coverage of each land class, which can be really helpful. So as we can see here, um, a country like Zambia has um, its highest percentage of vegetation cover, that's 62% of uh, forest area. So it's a really quick, easy way to kind of get a look at land cover, get an idea of what fuels are available for fires, um, things like that. And I'll just really quickly navigate back and I'll just show you another country. So we're gonna take a quick look at Kenya just to show a little bit of variation there. And the country viewer is gonna continue to give us um, some of these metrics here, um, it gives population totals, uh, cropland area, forest area, um, some of the same information that's just available here um, within this graph. We take a quicker look, uh, a closer look at Kenya, we'll see that uh, the land cover classification and, and percent coverage is very different for this country, um, with 53% as the majority of grass and shrubland area. This is just a really quick kind of simplistic way um, to start looking about land cover, looking at land cover and thinking about um, you know, the, the major fuel types within your management area. 
Um, and GWIS provides uh, these quick assessments um, for a variety of countries, all of which you can kind of go through and navigate. Um, we're just doing a really quick um, demo of GWIS um, with the viewer in these country profiles to give you an idea of kind of what's available, uh, particularly from like the vegetation perspective. But GWIS has a, a variety of data layers kind of spanning all of the different um, topics we're discussing throughout all six sessions um, of this training. So definitely take a look at GWIS, um, take some time to explore through each of the layers, um, look at the data that's available for each of um, your management areas maybe, um, and definitely feel free to use this, uh, this country profile as a way to start getting an idea um, of fuels within your area. All right, and so just one last thing that I wanted to show you is this data and services app um, under the GWIS applications right here. Um, this is a really quick and easy way to kind of get your hands on some of this data if you're not interested in using it, uh, in viewing the data within the GWIS platform. Um, you can download um, kind of a variety of these layers, um, a lot of which we didn't cover. Um, it gives you an interesting idea um, of like how many uh, data layers are available through GWIS. Um, but you can download all of these for your own use. You don't necessarily have to use the GWIS platform if you don't want to. The GWIS is a really good place to uh, get your hands on some of this data and download it if you need it. That concludes our demo of GWIS. All right, so there's a variety of tools available online for pre-fire monitoring, as you've just seen, um, but we by no means have covered them all, um, and we couldn't cover them all even if we tried. Um, so this slide lists some other tools that you might find useful to your fire risk mapping efforts, um, and you can reference these later when reviewing the slides. So to kind of wrap things up, we'll go ahead and take a closer look at the application of a couple of these tools uh, to the record setting 2020 fire season in California. So in 2020, six of the top 20 largest fires uh, in California occurred with over 3 million acres burned, two dozen deaths, 4,000 homes destroyed, and hundreds of thousands of people evacuated from their homes. Um, so conditions previous to these fires, um, as was kind of covered in session one, um, were warmer and drier with an extensive buildup of fuels. So over the next couple of slides, we're gonna focus on uh, a couple of data products um, that measure the impacts of these dry conditions and high temperatures on vegetation fuels. So first, we'll take a look at live fuel moisture content to assess fuel dryness. As a reminder, live fuel moisture content is the mass of water per unit of dry biomass in vegetation. Um, and this metric exerts a direct control on fuel ignitability, fuel availability, and fire spread, which makes uh, live fuel moisture content a really important parameter in assessing fire risk. So we'll be using the data available from the live fuel moisture content earth engine app um, that we went over in the last section about tools. Um, and this model uh, that produced the data set um, uses optical and SAR remote sensing data as well as data from the national fuel moisture database um, to kind of combine some of those remote sensing data products with um, ground-based data as well. So here I've provided live fuel moisture maps averaging data from the model over the months of June 2020 and September 2020. So a great feature of this data set is uh, that it's available on Google Earth Engine. So there's a link on the Earth Engine app um, to their GitHub repository. Um, on that, that main first page of the app, if you go back to the tools section and you, you click on that link and you start navigating um, the Google Earth Engine app itself. So I was able to access the Earth Engine code and uh, kind of simply alter the date range um, for data display to create these monthly average maps. And this wasn't really something too challenging. Um, if you have access to Google Earth Engine or if you're willing to kind of take a chance to, to aggregate some of your own data, um, you can refer to the directions on their GitHub repository on their GitHub repository page um, to see how to do this for yourself. Um, it was pretty quick and easy for me. Um, they have some really good instructions on there, um, and I highly recommend you take a look at that if you're interested in um, things like these monthly mean maps. So as you'll note, the monthly average map for June 2020 has already started to show um, some low live fuel moisture content, um, particularly within Southern California. And then as the summer fire season progresses, um, you can see in the map for September 2020, 
you see these extreme low live fuel moisture content areas uh, kind of throughout the state. Um, this decrease in live fuel moisture uh, definitely contributed to the availability of dry, easily ignited fuel in California, um, particularly for fires later in the summer fire season. And so these next set of figures um, use data from uh, the ESI web map we viewed earlier within the tools section. Um, and we can see similar areas of vegetation dryness uh, via the evaporative stress index here, um, similar to the live fuel moisture content maps. Um, but you'll note that evaporative stress was uh, high in Northern and Southern California over the summer fire season of 2020. Um, these two maps display static dates of evaporative stress throughout the state um, on August 8th and September 13th. Um, and at this point, later in the summer fire season, High ESI, ESI values indicate areas with dry and stressed vegetation, uh, particularly in Northern and Southern California, where a majority of a lot of uh, those larger fires um, ignited and, and more burning took place. So stressed vegetation areas, um, as measured using the ESI, likely contributed to these fire conditions, um, but it's also really important to note that ongoing fires likely contributed to some of these very high evaporative stress index values. And overall, uh, these two methods of vegetation moisture assessment, um, that is the live fuel moisture content and ESI, um, give us these ways uh, to assess how pre-fire vegetation condition um, might be impacting fires. Um, it's also really important to note that metrics like these tend to line up pretty well with um, climate-based data sources, and that's things like um, humidity, uh, temperature, some of the other topics that you went over in uh, session one, um, definitely have an impact on uh, the vegetation metrics that we tend to assess for fire. All right, and with that, uh, we've kind of finished up the main content of this session. Uh, to summarize, we discussed a variety of vegetation factors that contribute to fire fuel characterization. Uh, we provided some examples for remote sensing data products that can be incorporated into uh, your fire risk mapping. Um, and we also went over a variety of sensors and online tools useful for vegetation-based fire applications. And this is just a quick reminder uh, to attend the next session of the fire series uh, that will cover satellites and sensors for active fire monitoring. So thank you all for attending this session and we're gonna go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion of the session. All right, awesome. Thank you all again for joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and try to dive right into some of these great questions that you all had. Um, it looks like we've got the questions mirrored on the screen. Great. Um, one quick reminder, um, I don't think I mentioned this uh, previously, but just remember that the homework uh, for parts one and two is already available on the website, if that's something that you're interested um, in kind of knocking out. Um, but we will go ahead and get started with our first question, which is, to what extent can we pull fire model parameters, uh, things like bulk density, fuel moisture, um, et cetera, from remote Lucense data? Let's see. So vegetation-related uh, fire model parameters can be pulled from a variety of data sources and online tools. Um, and within this session, we covered some of the online tools that you might find useful for things like this. Um, so for example, uh, we covered GWIS, which can be used to navigate and download uh, fuel type and land cover info. Um, and then there's also data products uh, directly available from uh, sensor mission uh, websites or data access portals like um, Earth Explorer, things like that. Um, and those are the pretty widely available um, and give you that kind of direct access from satellite missions. I um, mean, an example of this is uh, SMAP soil moisture data, um, which can be pulled uh, as a fuel moisture metric. Um, and we really encourage you to uh, refer to the sensor summary table uh, in the presentation uh, for some useful data product links as well. Because um, we know we covered a lot of those. Um, I think this question was toward the beginning of the webinar. So feel free to review those and see if um, that uh, works for your needs. And then if you have any additional questions about that, um, feel free to email us. Awesome. So our second question. Um, is there a land cover map focusing on understory? Uh, what are the limitations of using land use land change maps 
in their uh, use for understanding fire risk in light of their focus on trees and lack of trees? Um, well, that's a pretty um, specific definition of a LULC map. Um, a, a lot of land cover classification maps don't necessarily focus on um, trees and lack of trees. Um, that really kind of depends on the maker of that land classification map or um, whatever land classifications the analyst is interested in. Um, but I know that particularly for one of the tools that we went over, um, the North American Wildland Fuels Database tool, um, it has the option to select understory as the fuel stratum to, to map wherever you're interested. Um, and I provided the link again here for that. Uh, but unfortunately, that's that's pretty limited to North America. So if you're in uh, Canada, the US, or Mexico, you might be in luck. Um, otherwise, there's there's quite a variety of fuel maps available globally as well. And so I really recommend looking through uh, the resources that we provided um, within the presentation itself, just to, to click through some of the links, some of the tools uh, that we've made available to to get a better idea of what types of land classification are possible. Um, I don't exactly remember from GWIS, but that might also be one of the uh, parameters available within GWIS as well. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, a site-specific land cover classification can do a really good uh, job of mapping vegetation type um, if it also uses ground-based training data or validation data. So really when you have, say, an analyst or um, an organization that's really familiar with the area, itself you can do a better land classification um, whether that's supervised with good training data from the ground or um, with good validation data points um, that are also collected in the field all right so our third question is why are human factors not considered in fire risk mapping since most wildfires are the result of human activity so this is a great question uh, human factors are actually considered um, in fire risk mapping uh, but usually from that ignition source perspective um, and in this training we were really just kind of focusing on uh, vegetation-based biophysical parameters uh, that can influence fire risk um, so we weren't really focusing on this topic but i can assure you that that's something that is considered um, within fire risk mapping uh, we just weren't able to cover it within this session all right section four when determining anomalies, what is usually considered a sufficient period for the average? Um, so that depends pretty largely on the amount of data available. Um, so with some satellite data, um, such as Landsat, there are several decades of data available. This gives you a really um, wide range of data uh, availability. And so therefore, technically, you may look at all of these images as an average and see which years show either positive or negative anomalies. I will say that within um, a lot of the data products that I've seen, um, you usually have, say, the average based off of a decade. Usually somewhere more than a decade is pretty sufficient, I would say, for um, the average. But this definitely varies depending on the parameter that you're looking at. Um, but I know with a lot of uh, NDVI assessments, um, looking at anomalies, um, 10 years seems to be kind of a, a good standard for that. And question five. Concerning NDVI anomaly for the long-term average, is this yearly? Is this a yearly average or is it monthly average over the years? So you have the potential to use either. I mean, it really depends on the question that you're trying to answer. Um, for instance, if it is related to seasonality, monthly averages over uh, the years might be more useful. Whereas if you're looking at trends over decades or a similar time frame, um, yearly averages might end up being more useful for you. So it really depends on. Um, what time scale you're looking at those averages um, for your own work. All right, and question six, is there a way to use remote sensing to identify the difference between low vegetation moisture and tree die off due to invasive species? All right, so uh, remote sensing of tree health and vegetation moisture uh, can be differentiated uh, by indices uh, by the indices that you end up using in your analysis. So, for example, uh, the evaporative stress index uses temperature data to assess vegetation moisture, um, and NDVI uses a measure of greenness to assess vegetation health. So that's just an example of basically saying that um, when you use different physical parameters, um, things like temperature or greenness, you can really help make this distinction um, just within the data that you're using. Um, can't really speak too much to uh, tree die-off due to invasive species, especially in this training. It's a little beyond our scope. 
Um, but one really good way to look at that is um, really measuring those physical parameters. And if you have two different physical parameters, like temperature and greenness, that can be really helpful um, in differentiating between the two. Um, because greenness, while affected by vegetation moisture, is not a metric for vegetation moisture itself. All right. So is there a preference between soil adjusted vegetation index and normalized difference vegetation index? So NDVI is kind of seen as the classic index for vegetation health um, as it measures uh, greenness, like we mentioned in the previous question. Um, and in areas where vegetation is sparse, um, the SAVI is more useful as it also takes into consideration the influence of uh, the soil brightness if the vegetation cover is low. So this is a little bit of a kind of choose your own adventure with a vegetation index. Um, you can go with something that's classic like the NDVI. If you have really sparse vegetation in your study area, maybe an SAVI is a little bit more appropriate um, for your needs. And then um, one that also wasn't mentioned here was the enhanced vegetation index. And this one can actually be really good for measuring more uh, densely vegetated areas as well. So it kind of depends on what your study area is, what type of vegetation exists there, um, as to what's gonna end up working best for your own um, purposes. All right. Question eight. So can we utilize eco-stress imagery products for fire risk management? So I'm hesitant to say that this is a, a complete yes or no situation. Um, so e eco-stress products provide a great opportunity to assess uh, evaporative stress on vegetation, um, but it really depends on kind of the unique environments of your own fire risk assessment. Um, like for example, if you've identified the need to assess vegetation impacts from drought, EcoStress's ESI product might end up being useful for you. Um, it really depends on how that fire risk assessment is being done, um, especially when you're considering remote sensing data inputs. Um, it's really important to note that you're limited by uh, spatial resolution, that's the size of the pixel. Um, you wanna make sure that that's something that fits with your fire risk assessment. Um, if, say like mapping EcoStress's ESI ends up being something that you include within a report about fire risk, maybe that's helpful. Um, as its own distinct data product. Um, it really kind of just depends on what your needs are and um, how you need to manipulate the data for your own purposes. All right, and question nine. Do you think there's a lack of communication between remote sensors and fire managers on the meaning of risk? Because their definition of risk is different. Your risk definition is typically their hazard definition and their risk definition very specifically refers to the effect of fire hazard on highly valued resources and assets. Um, so this is a really great question. Um, I think it really kind of gets to the core of fire risk itself, which isn't necessarily something that can be, um, I guess, traditionally defined by one definition um, or one frame of thought. Um, remote sensing from a vegetation-based fire perspective often focuses on the assessment of hazards. Um, so the definition we provided is probably a little too tailored to today's session. So it's not necessarily something that's going to apply to all fire risk assessment or every fire risk assessment that you come into contact with. Um, and with this kind of variety of ways in which uh, fire risk is framed, um, it's really important to look at as many resources as possible when you're thinking about doing your own fire risk assessment. So I wanna thank the person who asked this question for providing this resource from the Forest Service. It's a really good um, article to take a look at if you're interested. Awesome. So question 10. So how does long-term climate change or short-term climate variability impact the use of ESI since ESI is determined uh, by plus or minus standard deviations? Um, for example, comparison to normal uh, when climate change is redefining what normal means. Um, this is a really timely question. Um, uh, I'm not really an expert on this per se, but I believe that the short-term variability is detected relatively easy given its difference from the long-term mean. Um, and, and like I said, I'm not really 100% sure on this, uh, but I would imagine that long-term climate change will ultimately influence the current normal um, and change the way in which the ESI itself is calculated. Um, and I would really encourage you to look at some of the ESI links we've provided uh, within the slides to get a better idea of how this might work. And then if uh, anybody else on the line from the RSET team wants to say anything about this? I know we have some really climate focused people on the line, so feel free to, to jump in if you'd like to. Okay. 
Awesome. Well, then we'll just go ahead and move on to the next question. You're going to notice with these questions that I'll, I'll refer you back pretty frequently to uh, the presentation itself. We have a lot of information linked there. So I definitely think it warrants kind of a look back through the PDF um, uh, after the session's over uh, to get an idea of what those resources are, what links you can click on to, to engage with some of these tools and data products themselves. Awesome. So question 11. What is the difference between the data from NDVI and land cover? Does NDVI also provide the data for vegetation density? Um, in general, quantity of vegetation per unit of area. So NDVI is a measure of greenness. It's not necessarily land cover, which is usually obtained through supervised or unsupervised land classifications and provides more details on the type of vegetation in a particular site. Um, so NDVI um, can be a really good metric for mapping vegetation over a landscape. So if you're really just focused on uh, green vegetation, that's, that's your biggest interest, then uh, NDVI can be a really great way to map that. Um, if you're more interested in the different types of vegetation within your study area or even different land classes like bare soil or urban areas, um, human settlement areas, things like that, then land cover is probably going to be what you're looking for. Uh, land cover assessment is also a really nice way to um, differentiate between those vegetation classes. So you'll have something like a forest versus a shrubland, um, crop versus grassland. Land cover classifications can do a really good job of differentiating those things for you. Um, and then one thing that I will mention about NDVI, though, we, we didn't really go too much into detail with this, um, but NDVI is a really good metric to use for phenology. So if you're particularly interested in crops or agriculture, um, NDVI can be a really good way to identify uh, agricultural areas just based off of the, the green up cycles and uh, crop man management uh, procedures as well. So we'll move on to question 12. Uh, where can I find soil and use coverage for the entire world? Do you know some scripts to do that or some local to download, somewhere local to download this information? Um, so I would say, based off of what we talked about today, um, it looks like what you're, you're most interested in is like a good land cover map. Um, and I would say globally, um, at least at this point and with what we've discussed within the session, GWIS is probably a good place to start for, for a land use land cover perspective um, across the globe. And this data can be pretty easily uh, downloaded through the portal that we showed during the session. Um, I believe there's a tab uh, where you can just, which actually I think we went over, um, you can just click and then any of the data layers available through GWIS you should be able to download uh, for your own purposes. And you can also use GWIS as a way to um, navigate that data, check to see first if it works for you, check to see if the resolution works for you. And it's a good way to also kind of compare, um, say, that global data to maybe local data that you have um, just to see how they match up or compare to each other. Um, so you can kind of figure out what works best, uh, best for your own particular needs. All right, so we will move on to question 13. So can leaf area index or LAI uh, be used to measure the forest fuel load? If yes, then how? So leaf area index can definitely be a useful metric um, in measuring fuel load, especially from a vegetation density perspective. Um, and as I mentioned kind of previously throughout the training, um, we didn't really have time to provide you with like this big inclusive list of useful vegetation parameters uh, for this training. Um, so this is definitely something that that's related to the work that we've been discussing, but we just didn't necessarily have time to cover. Um, but you can find more info about the leaf area index, uh, particularly from MODIS here at this link that I've provided. Um, and this can be a really good way to assess uh, canopy density as well, um, which is great. Awesome, so question 14. Can remote sensing be used to assess vegetation structure in non-forest fuels like shrubland? Um, would you need to adapt the indices or approach uh, used for different types of vegetation? Shrubs compared to forest stands um, is an example of that. Um, really useful and informative presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> um, 
So basically vegetation structure uh, can be assessed in non-forested areas uh, like shrubland areas, um, but your methodology would likely need to be adapted uh, from a forest perspective. Um, you know, radar data, LIDAR data can be helpful for assessing vegetation structure in shrubland areas, depending on the, I guess, three-dimensional structure of the vegetation you're looking at. Um, you might be able to decide that maybe a land cover classification would work a little bit better than a more complicated vegetation structure assessment. Um, so for shrubland, maybe what works best for you is completing a shrubland focused land cover classification where you have really good training data from the ground um, to look at where shrubland is located. And then maybe you have a maximum or minimum range of standard heights for this shrubland vegetation. It kind of just depends on what your ecosystem is. Um, and what vegetation types exist over the landscape. Um, but depending on the complexity or amount of biomass uh, within that vegetation structure, um, you might find that a land cover classification could do something um, similar for you here as it goes for shrubland. Um, but that might not be the case. Um, but that's just to, to assure you that if you were interested in using radar LIDAR data, um, that's definitely something that you could do uh, within a shrubland ecosystem. Awesome. So question 15. Are the equatorial countries or tropics more prone to fire conditions? Um, so this is a great question. Uh, tropical or equatorial countries typically have one or more rainy seasons and hot summers. So it really depends on what part of the year you're comparing. Um, and also usually the vegetation is different at least at a forest level. Uh, temperate forests tend to be dominated by pine type plants uh, versus tropical forests are more dominated by broadleaf vegetation. Um, so there's a couple of things to consider there. Um, it's the climatic conditions, um, seasonality of precipitation, um, as well as uh, the types of vegetation that you typically find within those areas. Awesome. So question 16. Can the same kind of sensors and satellites used for vegetation be used for city fires? If not, what satellite, what satellites are used for that? Let's see. So this really depends on uh, your definition of a city. Uh, typically, heavily developed human settlements are not really ideal for this vegetation-based fire risk assessment since vegetation might not be the main source of fuel in these areas. Um, so that's to say, like, if you had a really densely populated city, say, like, New York City, then a, a vegetation-based assessment for fire might not necessarily be relevant because the fires within that city might spread from, say, like, structure to structure, to structure rather than um, using vegetation as a main fuel. Um, but if you're talking about a city that's pretty green, might be less densely populated, um, then vegetation might come into play there, especially if you have um, a, a city that's bordering um, lots of natural ecosystems, maybe protected areas, land management areas. Um, so in these cases, you'd probably look, be looking at uh, human settlement and proximity to uh, vegetation fuels. Uh, that's, that's really just from the vegetation perspective. Can't speak too much to um, the assessment of fires within cities, um, but I can say that one thing to take into consideration is what are your vegetation fuels within the city? Um, and if there aren't many, if that doesn't seem to be a good metric for you, um, for the spread of fire, for ignition, things like that, um, then remote sensing uh, fire risk might not necessarily be uh, good for your study area. All right, question 17. Is the EO1 Hyperion available globally? And what is the accuracy of vegetation classification? So there's a lot of uh, different EO1 Hyperion images available around the world. Um, and this coverage uh, can be pretty spotty and it's not by any means global, which basically just means that there's, there's images available around the world, um, but those images themselves don't have quite global coverage. Um, you'll find swaths of Hyperion imagery um, in specific areas. Sometimes these areas have been requested by um, different research proposals or um, organizations with management concerns. Um, so it's always a good idea to kind of take a look at what data is available from a swath perspective. Um, and with EO1 Hyperion in particular, I think that a, a really good place to start is just on Earth Explorer. And I can add that link to this after after the session. Um, and you can navigate through Earth Explorer and just take a quick look um, at what data is available um, on the, the map viewer. 
Um, so if you're really interested in a particular area, you can just look at all the Hyperion imagery that's available um, and see if any years intersect with, with your study area. Um, and one good place to look for that is our training um, on hyperspectral data for um, land and coastal management. We did a demo of Earth Explorer for this particular purpose for, for Hyperion. So if you're really interested in, in that Hyperion data, I would say that's a really good place to go. I think that's session two of the hyperspectral training um, where we talked um, about uh, land data options and applications. Um, and to your question about accuracy, uh, the, the accuracy of a Hyperion-based classification depends on things like training data and the analyst's familiarity with the study area. Um, kind of the same things that all, all land classifications depend on. Um, Hyperion just gives you the option of having more data, um, more spectral data in particular. So you have uh, a ton of bands. I think Hyperion has over 200 bands um, that you can use to differentiate uh, spectral uh, reflectance of like various different vegetation species or types um, and it really kind of depends on how how specific you want that vegetation classification to be um, you could do types kind of your classic land cover whether that's crops shrubland forest um, or you could even go all the way up with the right training data the right experience with uh, the study area um, to a species level I know we provided an example of a species level classification on the slide, um, but it's really important to note that that's um, from a research paper that was really closely associated with that study area. Um, so they had a lot of uh, good experience on the ground and good data from the ground to train that classification, um, which I guess is a really long-winded way of uh, answering your question and saying that accuracy depends on, um, on the data that you have available to train that classification or your own familiarity with. Uh, with the area you're trying to classify. Awesome. So fire is not only impacted by biophysical variables, but also by uh, various social and anthropogenic variables. If one were to incorporate these variables in a remote sensing and GIS setting, um, how would one approach it? So this is a really good question, but unfortunately it's not really something that we can speak to um, within this session uh, since we're focused mostly on vegetation. Um, but I would imagine that some relevant factors would be things like population density and proximity to human settlement, um, some of which I, I guess in this case would be uh, more GIS related data. Granted, I think you could, um, you could probably use remote sensing for that proximity to human settlement. Um, that would be like maybe proximity of um, ideal fire fuel sources uh, to human settlements. Um, or recreation areas that might be vulnerable to human settlement and visitation rates, things like that. Um, so it's definitely an interesting intersection. I think that's a great question. I think that's something that is also on a, a lot of people's minds, um, but unfortunately just within the session, we weren't really able to cover um, anything like that since we're focused more on the, the biophysical components. Um, but definitely rest assured that that's, that's something that a lot of um, scientists are considering within their fire risk assessment work. Awesome, so question 19. Why do you recommend SRTM, uh, the sh Shuttle Radar Topography Mission uh, Digital Elevation Model data instead of the PALSAR RTC Digital Elevation Model um, at 12 meter resolution? Um, so here, um, someone provided a great link uh, to a paper that compares both SRTM and PALSAR DM data used um, and its advantages and disadvantages for Brazil. And in general, it shows the highest efficacy for SRTM data in detecting geologically meaningful lineaments. Um, nonetheless, provided there is data available from both sensors um, in your study area, it doesn't hurt to try to use both um, and then choose the appropriate one based on your research question. Um, and that's also to say, we are also a little bit more familiar with using SRTM ourselves. Um, so that in no way is meant to discourage you from trying to use PALSAR data. Um, it's definitely a great data source. The digital elevation model could, could definitely be of use to you. Um, we're also just a little bit more familiar with using the SRTM DEM. So we'd, we'd really encourage you to take a look at uh, both data sources and figure out which one works best for you. All right, what are the main problems in using out-of-date DEM data as Allos Pulsar um, in fire risk assessment uh, since this parameter is not strongly affected in a short-term range in most cases? Yeah, so this is a really great question. Um, I would say, fortunately, something that's kind of indicated within this question is that 
topography isn't necessarily uh, changing quite as much as other uh, physical parameters that we assess with remote sensing. Um, so to compare that to something like vegetation, which has tons of changes, whether those are human impacts or seasonal variations in green up, um, topography thankfully doesn't necessarily have um, quite that much variation. You can definitely have um, extreme changes in topography, especially after disasters, things like um, flooding or landslides, uh, but those tend to be a little bit more uh, rare. So we tend to think that uh, a DEM um, from say within the same decade could be uh, still usable, um, still helpful in your assessments. I know SRTM is, is getting a little bit older, but it's still something that we um, tend to use. Same with Alice Pelsar. We, we kind of accept that as a caveat of using this type of data, that there might be some topography changes that just aren't detected, um, but we kind of accept a little bit of that risk um, and then still use the DEM data as our, our really good metric for topography because it's some of the best topography data that we currently have access to. Oh, so that's a really good question. Awesome. Do non-government researchers have access to FIA data? Yes. Um, FIA data can be a little bit difficult to navigate. Um, their website uh, has a ton of links, um, <laughs> some of which are to data, some of which are to projects that are going on with FIA. Um, but typically, if you can get into contact with um, someone from the Forest Service who works on um, the forest inventory analysis, um, they can help guide you uh, to whatever data products you're most interested in. Um, like I said, you can use some of the uh, pre-made data products that they have available, um, but at least within my experience and with some of the, the researchers that I know who use FIA data, um, it's always really good to have that Forest Service contact. Um, so I'll try my best uh, after this session to find, um, say, maybe like a general inquiry email or something like that that we can include within this question um, so that you have uh, maybe a, a little bit more contact with someone at the U.S. Forest Service so that you can get your hands on some of that data if you're interested. Awesome. So slide 55 shows a really nice map. How can we create the map? Was it done in GEE? I'm going to take a quick look to remind myself what that map is in particular. Let's see. Slide 55. So I think you're referring to the evaporative stress index. Um, I can I can talk about both uh, the the ESI as well as the live fuel moisture content, just in case um, that's what you were really asking about. Um, but for the evaporative stress index map viewer, um, the evaporative stress index is um, a widely available uh, global data set. Um, so that's not necessarily something that you would need to create yourself. Um, I would really recommend looking at this map viewer for the evaporative stress index. Um, one really nice thing about this is that that data layer is importable into ArcGIS kind of immediately. You can just go ahead and open it up in your desktop ArcGIS. If you don't have access to ArcGIS, which I know is a lot of people since you have that pay component there, um, you can also access that data, I believe, directly from uh, the NASA USDA cooperation uh, to create the evaporative stress index. I mean, I believe that that link is included within the summary table of uh, sensors for, oh, it might not actually be. Um, regardless, I'll go ahead and provide in this, the answer to this question, um, a link to, um, oh, actually, you know, it might be right there with, within the slide, but I'll go ahead and just copy the link again so that you have access to the actual uh, data product page from uh, NASA USDA. Um, so that you'll have access to uh, all of the specifications for that data. And then for uh, the live fuel moisture content map, um, that is an Earth Engine app that's based on a publication um, that's linked um, uh, directly from the tool. So it's definitely um, a, a great idea to look at that paper uh, by Rao et al. Um, from 2020. It's an open access paper that you can just click on the link um, on the main page of that Earth Engine app um, and take a look at the methodology. Um, so that's definitely something that you can use to, to manipulate the data for your own purposes as well. That's what I did for um, our California case study. I ended up clicking a, a second link was on the main page of that Earth Engine app, uh, the GitHub repository, um, and I was able to access their Google Earth Engine code, and it was 
it was really well laid out. Um, great tutorial of how to change the date ranges. Um, and I basically just copy and pasted the code into Google Earth Engine. Um, and then I was able to change the date range in which it would um, assess the mean of live fuel moisture content over whatever time period I defined. Um, and I chose a monthly time period. Um, so I was able to define that for my months of interest. Um, and then I, I just added another really quick copy paste script um, to change the background uh, to that black color that you see within, um, uh, within the Earth Engine app. Um, and that's how I ended up making those maps. Um, it's a really nice thing about Google Earth Engine is you can kind of manipulate the data to your own purposes. Um, obviously in this case, the live fuel moisture estimates were done kind of behind the scenes and in different code. I was really just changing the dates and changing the mean um, of those mapped variables. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that you can engage in um, for yourself, um, particularly if you have a specific study area of interest. Awesome. So let's see. All right, question 23. So is there a land cover map for C3 uh, to C4 grasses? Um, so someone's been very kind and linked a paper with global C3, C4 uh, grass distribution maps that might be useful. And so you can take a look at that link. Um, and it's a bit old um, from 2003, it looks like. Um, and you can also uh, click that link to the NASA DAC where there's more information about data that can be obtained, uh, um, at least for C4 plants. Awesome. All right, question 24. Um, thank you for this very informative presentation. Um, well, thanks for attending. Um, so in reference to slides uh, 24 to 34, are there materials you can refer us to on how to apply this information? For example, how to process LIDAR correctly, using tools like ArcGIS to create a workflow that flags high-risk areas? So that's a great question. I'm just gonna go back to the slides to get a quick look to make sure that I'm referencing the same slides that you are. Awesome. Yeah, so there's a lot of resources available um, for applying this data. Um, so many that we weren't really able to cover those in detail uh, within this presentation. Um, but you'll find that uh, I think a, a good resource um, for the question you're asking is the, the summary table of sensors, um, where I go through some of the data products and give links to those pages. That can be a really good uh, starting point to at least see what these data products are, particularly from um, NASA or ESA or JAXA, um, just to get your hands on some of that, that data itself. Um, and start looking at what resources are available um, for applying that data. Um, there's a, a wealth of tutorials out there for uh, things like you mentioned, like LIDAR assessment, um, also vegetation type and extent assessment, land cover classifications, all these things that we're, we're kind of focusing on. Um, so I would say if you have a particular interest, um, definitely get in contact with us, uh, send us an email, and maybe I can point you in the direction to some, some good resources for that. Um, otherwise, you might be able to find some things within your own searches, um, relevant tutorials, things like that, that might be of use to you. Um, and I would always say, uh, I, th I think we'll just link you right back to um, the RSET website as well to see if there are any trainings that might help you with some of those um, assessments that you're interested in doing as well. Um, but definitely if you're unable to find, say like an RSET resource for something like that, definitely get in contact with us and we'll, we'll try to point you in the right direction. Awesome. So can we get land cover information about a particular area of our country on GWIS? Does GWIS, sorry, does GWIS cover the Indian region? So GWIS is global, so hopefully you wouldn't have any uh, coverage issues there. Um, I believe there might be some areas that you might not be able to access, and if that's the case, um, definitely feel free to get into contact with uh, the distributors of GWIS. That would be a little maybe a little too high level though, but if there's something in particular that you're interested in um, within GWIS other than land cover, like also also let us know um, via email and maybe we can point you to something. But I'd say for land cover information, uh, what we showed within the demo is typically, um, I think the highest resolution that you could expect from, from GWIS's land cover or fuel assessments. Um, but as I mentioned before, those uh, land cover assessments are 
uh, available for download. Um, you can download them, I believe, in either TIFF or shapefile format. I'm not, I'm not sure specifically, um, but you can then clip those data sets uh, to your own specific study areas. Um, unfortunately, you might notice that uh, they aren't uh, the spatial resolution that you're looking for. Um, it really just kind of depends on what you're trying to do within that particular study area within your country. Um, but definitely be sure to take a look at what, what data you can download from GWIS um, if you're interested in a little bit more site-specific assessment um, or mapping. So question 26, what's the spatial resolution of layers in GWIS? Uh, do they have the same spatial resolution and can we download the data with a uh, shapefile, for example, within a state? Um, so yes, I feel like I just answered this question. Um, so sorry about that. but. Uh, spatial resolution of the layers in GWIS varies. Um, I believe, for example, the land cover classification is at 300 meters, I think. That, that might be wrong, don't necessarily quote me on that. Um, but the layers themselves, I think, do have some variation. Um, I'm not sure how widespread that variation is, the 300 meters or whatever that land cover classification resolution is, um, might be the standard. Um, but that's definitely something that I can look up. Um, and provide within the answer to this question. So you can take a look once we upload the PDF. Let's see. And can we download data with a shapefile? Yeah. So as I said, I'm kind of unsure whether or not the, the data is in shapefile format. Um, it's more than likely in like GeoTIFF or NetCDF, um, but you should definitely be able to download that data. And then as I mentioned, you might um, have to end up clipping it to whatever your extent is. So can live fuel moisture content be used for post-fire assessment as well? Yes, it definitely can. Um, live fuel moisture content can be a, a good indicator of, um, say, vegetation stress post-fire. Um, that's definitely something that we're going to touch on in um, session six of our uh, FIRES webinar series. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about how a, a lot of these vegetation um, indices and metrics that we've we've discussed today can be used at the post-fire stage as well. Um, so hopefully this will have been kind of our uh, <laughs> our dump of vegetation indices and parameters um, so that we can then um, move on to looking at how those apply at the post-fire um, portion of the fire cycle. So how can GWIS create a current land cover map? So that's kind of a, a difficult question to answer. They're, they're attempting to upload their land cover uh, classifications as quickly as possible. Um, it depends on, um, I think, their own assessment of land cover and the work that they're doing as to how recent that land cover map is. Um, so that's another really good point that you actually raised with this question, that the, the uh, temporal component of that land cover classification might not end up being um, quite as useful for your own purposes. Um, but at least at the global um, stage with those land cover maps, I think, I believe that GWIS is pretty limited in their ability to um, create those maps, uh, say at like a yearly time scale or something like that. Awesome. So is EcoStress data good to use for research purposes? Yeah, so go ahead and refer to question eight above on that. Um, it would definitely depend on the research question you're trying to answer with EcoStress. Um, but as I mentioned, if evaporative stress is something that you're really interested in, um, evapotranspiration kind of as a conceptual, uh, more research-related term related to evaporative stress, um, I would say EcoStress is definitely a great mission to um, get into contact with. Um, they're currently uh, releasing data kind of as they get it, as they process it, um, but that mission is actually pretty good at engaging with researchers who are interested in using EcoStress. Um, because I think it also helps uh, those missions to see how the data is being used uh, by researchers and applied scientists, um, things like that. Awesome, so I see we got a question um, from the chat that I'll just address really quickly. Can you share the GE code for fuel moisture, for the fuel moisture script, please? Um, and I'll definitely provide a link to that. Um, it'll just be a quick link to the GitHub repository for the, um, um, for the researchers who created that Earth Engine app. And I'll go ahead and provide that. Um, within the Q&A doc. All right, question 30. Do you have any tools, any tool to define some more detailed frequency parameters of fire regime as fire return period uh, at pixel level? So we're going over quite a variety of tools um, uh, within this fire series. Um, so I think you'll notice that there are 
a lot of uh, tools that we're using that can be used for assessment of fire regime, um, whether that be like burn date, um, active fire, uh, just truly like a, a wealth of different parameters that we're using for this across the six sessions. So I would say definitely um, make sure you attend all of the sessions because there might be some data portal, some tool that like works best for this purpose that you're discussing. Um, but we're also going to be talking about uh, fire regimes and return period um, uh, within uh, session six of our webinar as well, um, particularly from um, a more like vegetation based land perspective. Um, let's see, fire return period at pixel level. I believe that any, any fire regime, fire return uh, period data that you see within the tools is at a pixel level. What that um, pixel resolution is, I'm not 100% sure. I know that for a lot of um, fire regime assessments using things like burn area, uh, normalized difference burn index, um, burn severity, things like that, um, typically we use Landsat for those, at least within our own experience. Um, so I would hope that that's at a Landsat 30 meter pixel level, but that might not necessarily be the case. Question 31, concerning uh, fractional cover, could you please explain more uh, for arid regions and how these can affect uh, the fire risk? So I'm not 100% sure um, what you're referencing in particular to arid regions. If that has to do with just the overall presence of vegetation, I would say that uh, fraction cover can be a really good way to um, assess vegetation at that sub-pixel level where say you have an arid region that has sparse vegetation. Um, so you might need that sub-pixel information to get a better estimate of vegetation. Um, like for example, say you have a 30 meter pixel um, and you have vegetation that's really densely packed within the center of that pixel. Um, then the pixel itself might not necessarily reflect as much vegetation as is seen there or the sparseness of that vegetation. So fractional covers are really good way to kind of get at that vegetation assessment um, in sparser vegetated areas um, at that subpixel level. I hope that answers your question, but definitely feel free to, to email us if you need further specification on that. All right, is the resolution of remote sensing based data good enough for building uh, level fire risk assessment? So I think that that definitely depends on um, what you're trying to do with your fire risk assessment. So if you're attempting to use remote sensing to create fuel models as inputs for your, your fire, fire models and ultimately some assessment of fire risk, that's largely going to depend on the specifications of the data that you need. Do you need point data? Do you need high resolution data? What is the maximum resolution that that data can be to then be incorporated into your risk assessment and modeling? Um, so there's definitely a data constriction there. I would say, or sorry, data restriction there, I would say. Um, but if you're interested in, I don't know, say a, a more general assessment of risk, looking at a lot of different parameters, providing a report on those parameters as an assessment of fire risk, um, then remote sensing can be a really good way to get at some of those uh, really relevant vegetation-based parameters um, that you might not necessarily be able to have at a landscape level otherwise. Um, and I know that's kind of a general answer, um, but if you have a specific question about that, I'll, I'll just say it again, feel free to email us um, and we can hopefully give you a little bit better of an answer. Awesome. So question 33. For the live fuel moisture content and evaporative stress index um, in slides 62 and 63 respectively, I didn't find those two products in GEE. Can you please share the scripts mapping those two indices? Oh yeah, so uh, as I mentioned uh, from the chat, I'll go ahead and share the GEE uh, script uh, on GitHub for the live fuel moisture content um, app and maps. Uh, but for the evaporative stress index, um, that's actually not created with uh, Google Earth Engine. Um, that's a pre-provided data product um, from NASA and the USDA um, that's just available on a web map from ArcGIS. Um, but as I mentioned before, I'll go ahead and provide the link, um, I think, to that, to that data product itself rather than the web map as well. And question 34, how can we determine the location of the start of the fire, especially if it was aroused? Let's see. 
I think with something like that, you'd be most interested in burned area mapping um, over a specific time scale. So say you have a certain temporal resolution um, with whatever sensor you're interested in using, whether that be say like Landsat 8 or Sentinel 2, um, and you just start looking at imagery um, of those fires. Um, active fire mapping is also something really useful for this, I would say, through MODIS. Um, if you can detect where those active fires start um, within the temporal resolution of uh, the sensor itself, um, that can give you a better idea of where the fire itself actually started. Um, so yeah, actually, I guess in thinking through that, probably your, your best bet there is some active fire mapping through MODIS, just so you can see kind of like the first appearance of that fire, um, which would give you a little bit more ignition information than just looking at where um, the fire burned in total. So I think the, the temporal resolution component of that is pretty valuable, which I think makes MODIS probably a good, a good candidate for something like that just because of its high temporal resolution. Um, definitely don't 100% take my word for that. You might find something different in your own work. Awesome. So question 35. Hi, is there information for fuel moisture content, folio moisture, oh, folio moisture content um, that can be used to calculate crown fire? I'd have to look a little bit more into that, um, particularly for from a crown fire perspective. Um, but I would imagine, yes, I definitely am going to need to look a little bit more into that. And maybe I can link you to a, a paper within this question after the session. Um, so definitely take a look back at uh, the Q&A doc um, once we post it on the website. Question 36. Is there a way to identify near real-time fire front fire propagation line that can feed into models for fire predictions? Yeah, so I think this ties in pretty well to um, some of the information that we discussed earlier with uh, Modus Active Fire products. I would say for this in particular, definitely tune into sessions three and four, our during our during fire sessions, and because I think they'll have a little bit better information for you on this. Um, since we're a little bit more uh, into the vegetation with our sessions, we don't necessarily have, I think, the best perspective on something like that. Um, so definitely tune into parts three and four for during fire and and feel free to ask this question again there. And I, I do believe that the the health and air quality team who's, who's working on this will have better um, suggestions for you as well. All right, so can NDVI identify tree species in forests? For example, differentiating between pine forest and a cork forest. So you bring up a really good point here. Um, NDVI, I wouldn't necessarily say is always great for uh, identifying tree species. Um, it's good at identifying different types of uh, trees. So if you're thinking at it from say like a coniferous perspective versus a deciduous perspective, um, there's a phenology to uh, deciduous trees where they have their leaf off period. Um, say in the fall, they lose all of their leaves and then coniferous trees or pine trees um, tend to keep all of their their needles, which gives them a, a high greenness level. So you can use that difference in in phenology and leaf on leaf off um, from deciduous trees as a way to differentiate between um, deciduous trees and coniferous trees. Typically, um, so, so you bring up a really good point there. Identifying pine forests this way is a is a really great application of NDVI. Um, but kind of beyond that. Um, and if you don't necessarily know the timing of say like leaf on leaf off of the trees you're interested in, NDVI isn't necessarily gonna be too helpful for differentiating tree species beyond that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and move to question 38. Are there any global fuels or vegetation data comparable to land fire? That's a really good question. Um, I think our go-to for that would be GWIS typically, I, I would really encourage you to look at some more of the data products available through GWIS. Um, the really nice thing about GWIS obviously is that everything is global um, and it gives you a pretty good perspective on um, a variety of fire related parameters. And um, we really only went over kind of a fraction of what GWIS can provide for you today. So I, I, I think it's a really good idea to go ahead and go back to GWIS, click through a lot of the layers, um, things like that. And question 39. What kind of methods are used to produce forecast products for wildfire risk? Are they supervised methods or mathematical models that use multiple parameters to produce a, a risk factor? Um, so that definitely depends on um, the types of, of products you're interested in. 
Um, something like measuring vegetation type and extent is going to be more of a supervised method, something with like a land classification, um, different parameters that take into account climate um, parameters, something like, say, like an ESI, um, that's going to be a little bit more um, intense from a mathematical modeling perspective, something like the, the live fuel moisture content um, assessment as well. Um, but I guess I would encourage you to consider what what is most important for your own fire risk mapping or for whatever, say, research interests that you have, um, and then kind of work back from there. So what are the physical parameters that you're interested in measuring? What vegetation-based parameters are you interested in measuring? Um, and then what data products are available um, for those? And then looking a little bit further into the data specifications. Um, and the, the summary uh, table of sensors that we talked about also has links to some of those data products as well. And then the tools that we've mentioned are also a good way to engage with some of that data. So what does FIA mean? Sorry, <laughs> I hope I wrote that out on the slide, but I'm not sure I remember if I did. Um, so FIA stands for the Forest Inventory Analysis. Um, it's a US Forest Service site that contains reports um, and the status on the status and trends in species, uh, size, health, um, among other parameters for trees um, and forested areas. Um, and definitely refer back to slide 52 on the presentation for more details and a link to the FIA website. Awesome, so it looks like we're a little over time um, and I think we're gonna cap it at that question 40. Um, but thank you all so much for attending. Um, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our emails are there on the slides themselves. And they're also at the top of the Q&A doc here. Um, so hopefully we were able to answer uh, most of the questions you had at least um, in enough detail. Um, and definitely tune in to our session uh, three, which is next Tuesday. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Bye everyone.